two and a half minutes. It's June 29, 1966, and for months the prisoners have watched the guards. They've noted details, memorized routines, and made maps of the POW camp using pebbles. Now it's all down to Dieter. Two and a half minutes is all the time he has before the guards return from retrieving their evening meal from the kitchen hut. A prisoner acting as lookout flashes Dieter the go signal. He yanks the pre-loosened logs up from the floor of his hut and squeezes through a small opening. He crawls through the secret tunnel under the fence surrounding the prisoner huts. He sneaks into a guard shack where he quickly snatches a couple rifles. By now, other prisoners are escaping. Dieter hands out the rifles and the prisoners scatter. Angry yells from the direction of the kitchen hut. The guards have realized that an escape is underway. They scramble toward Dieter. One shoots, sending a bullet whizzing just over Dieter's head. He fires back and drops the guard, but he's outnumbered. The swarm of enraged guards closing in. No way can Dieter shoot them all. As a young boy in Germany, Dieter Dangler witnessed Allied bombings of his village and decided that he was going to be a fighter pilot when he grew up. After a long slew of immigrating to the U.S., enduring a stint in the U.S. Air Force, college, and graduating from the U.S. Navy Aviation Cadet Program, Dieter finally became a pilot. He then underwent further instruction, training as an attack pilot to fly the Douglas AD Sky Raider. After training, Dieter was stationed aboard the aircraft carrier USS Ranger off the coast of Vietnam. It was here that he joined an ill-fated secret operation that would result in him becoming a POW. On February 1, 1966, just after 9 a.m., four Sky Raiders take off from the USS Ranger. They fly in formation at 10,000 feet on a classified mission to bomb targets in North Vietnam. When Dieter reaches the target, an anti-aircraft battery, he drops ordnance. The air defense system fires back, blasting the right wing of his plane with a 75mm shell. A second shell hits his engine. It sputters and dies. Mayday! Mayday! Dieter shouts into his radio as he begins to fall out of the sky. He makes a split-second decision not to parachute, worrying that he'll be an easy target for hostiles to shoot down. Thankfully, Dieter is able to guide his damaged plane toward a clearing in the jungle. As he plummets, he tosses flight charts, authenticator codes, and other classified material out of the cockpit so they won't be found. The plane hits a couple of trees and breaks apart. Dieter tumbles about the cockpit as the fuselage cartwheels several times. His helmet is yanked from his head, and a large piece of broken glass from the windscreen slams into his skull. Dieter wakes up in his cockpit about 100 feet from the rest of his wreckage. His head's bleeding, he has a concussion, he's banged up, and a huge purple bruise is blooming on his left knee. However, he still has on his survival vest and waist pack. Dieter starts to crawl. The crash made a thunderous racket. He knows he has to get away before anyone shows up. Eventually, he gets to his feet. He stumbles through the jungle until he's maybe half a mile from the crash site. Dieter then inspects his wounds. He bandages his knee and cleans his bleeding head as best he can, removing a large shard of glass. He inspects his compass and considers heading west towards Thailand, which is a US ally, but then again, that's what the enemy would expect him to do. Dieter decides to go north toward the Mekong River, which he estimates is some 30 miles away. If he isn't rescued after a few days, he'll head toward Thailand. For the next several hours, Dieter wanders through the jungle evading other humans. At night, he tries to bunk down in his sleeping bag but hardly gets any rest as he's attacked by countless mosquitoes and other insects. The next day, Dieter tries to signal planes flying overhead but they don't see him. Dieter continues his march through the jungle but makes a huge error. He ignores the traditional survival advice to avoid trails and watering holes because that's where he'd be most likely to run into other humans. Exhausted from hacking through the brush, Dieter walks on an established path. Unfortunately, he runs right into some Patet Lao troops, pro-communist Laotians. They immediately take him hostage. They tie Dieter's hands with rope and search him, taking his watch, compass, and going through his rucksack. He chatters at them in German, hoping to convince them that he's German, not a US soldier, but they just seem confused. That night, the guards drive big stakes into the ground and spread eagle Dieter between them. Tied up, Dieter can't even prevent leeches crawling up his legs. The next few days are a blur. Dieter is marched through the jungle at a punishing pace and tied up every night. His guards feed him poorly cooked sticky rice and he drinks unfiltered river water. Eventually, Dieter's original captors hand him off to a guerrilla group and he ends up in a village where a province chief speaks fluent French. Dieter speaks some French and is glad to be able to communicate. The chief spends hours talking to Dieter about the places he's visited in Europe. He makes sure that Dieter is treated well. For the first time in about a week, Dieter gets a full meal. He's allowed to bathe and his various injuries are treated. At night, he's allowed to sleep on a mat without being tied up. 
But then the chief demands that Dieter sign a document stating that the US is deliberately bombing women and children, and although Dieter disagrees with the policy, he's forced to fly these missions by the US government. When Dieter refuses to sign, the chief turns him over to some guards. They beat Dieter until he blacks out. Dieter is revived when the guards splash water on him. They tie him to a water buffalo and whip it into a trot. Dieter is dragged throughout the village, much to the merriment of the crowd. His clothes and skin shred. Dieter is given a second chance to sign the document condemning the US's actions, but still refuses, and Don the gorillas leave, taking Dieter with him. Again, Dieter spends a long day marching through the jungle. At night, Dieter manages to escape and hides on a hilltop, but as the sun rises, Dieter becomes extremely thirsty. He cuts up a succulent and tries drinking its liquid, but the plant is poisonous. Dieter's cheeks go numb and his throat swells shut. Desperate, Dieter stumbles down the cliff, drinking at a watering hole when the Patet Lao catch him. Angry that he escaped, the gorillas torture him. They twist his arms and hang him upside down from a tree. They beat him. They smear honey on Dieter's face and position a nest of black stinging ants under him. Dieter drifts in and out of consciousness. At night, Dieter is lowered into a small cave full of water. He spends the night numb, shivering in the cold. The gorillas hand Dieter over to some North Vietnamese soldiers who march him to a POW camp. It's February 14th, and it's only been 14 days since Dieter crashed. The primitive POW camp is run by a different group of Patet Lao. The guards imprison Dieter in a tiny, rickety prisoner hut filled with spider's nests. The hut is dark and hot. Lights get in through cracks and a few slats in the door. After the guards leave, prisoners in the hut next door whisper to Dieter. There are six other prisoners, pilot Duane Martin, aircrew Jean De Bruin, Chinese radio operator Tu Yik Chu, nicknamed YC, and three Thai cargo shippers, Prasit Thani, Prasit Pram Suan, and Pisidi Indradat. Dieter is stunned to learn that two of the prisoners had been imprisoned for over two years. Some of the POWs have tried to escape before, but were recaptured and severely punished. Dieter tells them that he's going to escape as soon as possible, but the others advise Dieter to wait for the monsoon season, which generally starts in May. He'll be harder to track in the rain and fresh water will be easier to come by. Dieter soon settles into a grim routine. Days are spent mainly in the fetid huts. Prisoners are briefly let out to use the latrine and have a little fresh air. Periodically, the guards take a prisoner to the North Vietnamese soldiers for interrogation. Prasit Thani, who speaks Laotian, Vietnamese, and English, acts as a translator. The guards use any pretext to viciously beat the prisoners. They often play cruel mind games, such as suddenly firing guns without ammo at the prisoners to see them flinch. The POWs keep up their spirits by having discussions at night regarding history, religion, etc. Dieter makes a chess set out of bamboo and rocks and teaches the other prisoners how to play. Each evening, the guards lock each prisoner into wooden foot blocks so they can't escape while the guards sleep. The prisoners fashion makeshift keys, which they keep hidden in their underwear, knowing that the guards won't search there. Every night, they secretly unlock themselves and only get back to their restraints at dawn before the guards wake up. The prisoners' meals are small portions of rice. Dieter secretly begins to dry out and hide rice to prepare for escape. Not long after Dieter arrives, the prisoners are moved to a newly built POW compound several miles from the old one. The new compound is hidden deeper in the jungle and is even harder to see from the air. A 15-foot woven bamboo fence encircles the camp. There's a single guarded gate which opens to a dirt path. Outside the fence at both ends of the compound are 30-foot guard towers that are overlooking the yard. Also outside the fence are several guard huts and a kitchen hut as well as a camp latrine. A small stream trickles nearby. In the stockade are two elevated log and bamboo prisoner huts with thatched, leaf-covered roofs. Each is about 18 feet long and 6 feet wide. The guards split the prisoners into two groups, the three Americans in one hut and three Thai prisoners in YC in the other. The arrangement actually helps to lessen tension between the prisoners. As of late, the Americans have been suspicious about Prasit talking to the guards behind their back. The prisoners quickly slip back into their normal, monotonous routine. Each morning, the prisoners are woken up early and get a trip to the latrine. Around 9 a.m., they're given rice for a quick breakfast and afterwards return to their huts. In the evening, they are again given rice. Months go by. The rains do not come. By mid-June, a famine is growing. The gorillas are no longer able to get rice from nearby villages. They start catching rats, tadpoles, and wild pigs for food. Of course, the prisoners are fed the worst parts of the animals. Over several days, Dieter secretly weakens the flooring of his hut by pouring water and urine around the support pole. He also slowly digs a hole under the stockade. He and the other prisoners note routines and work out details of an escape plan. 
Day by day, the prisoners grow weaker. They endure lack of food but also suffer from malaria, parasites, and bouts of dysentery. Ten of the 17 guards go on a longer trip to faraway villages seeking food. Only seven guards are left at the POW camp. Seven prisoners, seven guards. It's the best opportunity they're gonna get. But there's a hitch in the plans. YC has fallen extremely ill and can't walk. Gene refuses to leave his friend behind. The American POWs decide to take over the camp and signal a plane instead of escaping. 4 p.m. The guards go get their dinner from the kitchen hut. When Prasit Thani, who's acting as a lookout, gives the signal, Dieter springs into action. He pulls up the loose section of his hut's floor and squeezes through, then crawls under the fence. He creeps into the nearest guard hut and grabs three rifles. By this time, other prisoners have also squeezed through the hut floor and crawled out from under the fence. Dieter gives two of the Thai prisoners guns, the three of them run into the jungle. The guards realize that something's wrong and run out of the kitchen hut. They fire at Dieter, who shoots back, killing one of them. Another guard runs at Dieter with a machete, and Dieter kills him point blank. Gene's gotten a machine gun. He helps Dieter drop a third guard. But a few guards escape into the jungle, forcing the POWs to abandon their plan of taking over the camp. If the guards show up with reinforcements, they'll be toast. Dieter and Dwayne say an emotional, hasty goodbye to Gene, who's decided to stay behind with YC before plunging into the jungle. They hike until they reach a ridge not far from the stockade. They're dizzy and vomiting from the sudden exertion, but they're free. Exhausted, they make camp. They wake to rain. The monsoons have finally arrived. Dieter and Dwayne continue to hike through the jungle for the next few days. The constant rain makes their travels worse. There are endless mosquitoes and thick, sticky mud. The rice they had carefully dried gets moldy from the rain. They eat it anyway. Their blistered feet grow raw and get infected. They follow a creek. Wherever possible, they walk in the water so they don't leave footprints. The sun briefly comes out and Dieter is able to make a quick directional compass. Luckily, the creek they're following is meandering in the right direction, west, toward Thailand. At night, they huddle together for warmth. Reaching a steep mountainous area where the creek turns into a river, Dieter and Duane decide to build a raft and float down the river. The raft works and their plan is going well, that is, until they suddenly hear the roar of a waterfall. They abandon the raft and swim for it, lest they be swept over the falls. They start to run low on rice and have dizzy spells. They manage to kill a large iguana and gorge themselves on the stringy raw meat. They spend a single night in an abandoned village. Though the place is dry, they dare not stay longer. They keep hiking mainly through sheer force of will. A few times, they see planes and try to signal them. They crisscross the river a few times to avoid steep spots or impenetrable bush. Duane, however, is getting weaker and weaker. While he rests in a hidden makeshift camp, Dieter climbs to the top of a nearby ridge. When he has a vantage point, he realizes a horrible truth. They've been walking in a circle. Nearby is the river and he can see the abandoned village where they spent the night a few days ago. Duane and Dieter are demoralized. That night, Duane begins to shiver violently. He's experiencing a bad malaria attack. While Duane tries to rest, Dieter takes apart some of the ammo from his rifle and manages to build a fire. He signals a helicopter and it seems to circle before flying away. Dieter's elated. Someone will be back to rescue them shortly. But the helicopter never returns. Sick and starving, Duane and Dieter cautiously approach a nearby village for help, holding out their hands to show they are empty. But a villager brandishing a machete attacks them. He decapitates Duane. Horrified, Dieter manages to escape and hide in the jungle. The villagers spend a few hours hunting him before most of them give up. Dieter goes to the abandoned village and sets it on fire. He doesn't care if it alerts the Patet Lao or the villagers, he just wants a plane to see. The pilot of a C-10 does see it and curiously circles, but Dieter realizes they have no way to know that an American set the blaze. The plane drops some aerial flares and something attached to a small white parachute. Dieter finds the parachute canopy, but not what was attached to it. On a hill near the burnt-out village, Dieter uses the parachute to make an SOS. The next day, a troop of Patet Lao track Dieter via his footprints. Dieter follows them unseen at a safe distance. He's able to glean a little food from the campsite where they stop for lunch. Dizzy, Dieter hunkers down in some bushes and sleeps. The next morning, Dieter has trouble walking and fades in and out of consciousness. A black bear begins to follow Dieter, not attacking, but just waiting. Dieter crosses the river to evade the bear and sees a snake sunning itself on a rock. Without wondering if it's poisonous, Dieter catches the snake. Holding it taut between his two hands, he bites into it while it's still alive. Dieter's digesting his meal and falling asleep in the sun when he hears the sound of a Sky Raider flying low. He leaps up and waves some cloth. The plane circles and the pilot sees Dieter's SOS sign. It's July 20, 1966. Dieter has been missing nearly six months. 
He's rescued just about 100 miles from where he originally crashed. Dieter has two types of malaria, intestinal worms, fungus, jaundice, and hepatitis. He's incredibly malnourished and weighs only 98 pounds. Eventually, after over two months in the hospital, Dieter makes a full recovery. It takes him much longer to stop having flashback nightmares about the prison camp. Sadly, out of the seven prisoners, only Dieter and one other are definitively known to have survived. Once in the jungle, Prishadi splits from the Prasits. 32 days of wandering through the jungle later due to hunger, Prishadi faints on a road. He wakes up in captivity. A Lao villager finds him while he was unconscious. Prishadi ends up in Ban Nad in prison, which is later raided by the US on January 7, 1967. In fact, it's the only successful rescue of POWs during the Vietnam War. The two proceeds are never heard from again, neither are Jean and YC. However, in the spring of 1971, there's a CIA report with testimony from villagers claiming that Jean was again captured and sent to a camp where he was interrogated by English-speaking high-level North Vietnamese Army generals. Jean was last seen in January 1968, nearly two years after the escape. Upper-level CIA are skeptical of the report, but Jean's brother travels to Laos in 1972 seeking further information. Unfortunately, his trip isn't successful. Dieter's rescue is kept secret until he's fully debriefed and it's understood that he never signed any confessions. He receives the Navy Cross, one of America's highest military honors. Once word gets out, Dieter is a national hero. He's surprised by all the attention he receives, and he thinks anyone would have tried that hard to return home. And now that you reached the end of our video, why not keep the watch party going? Ever heard of the Jungle King? After accidentally killing an officer, an American soldier goes AWOL in Burma and befriends a local tribe. While hiding out in the jungle from invading Japanese forces, Australian soldier Robert McLaren was forced to perform surgery on himself.